to the World Massage Conference. Hello and welcome to the World Massage Conference. I'm Scott Dartnell and I will be your co-host for today's presentation with Judith Aston and our host, Leslie Young. If you're joining us for the live presentation today, remember to log into the chat room. You can use your Facebook or Twitter ID or simply log in as a guest where you can add your name. At any time, you can click on the notes and download any of them uh, the presenter has prepared for this presentation. Judith Aston will be in the chat room and on our live event as well to answer as many questions as possible. I'd like to take a moment to talk about our presenter, Judith Aston. Today, we are having a conversation with Judith Aston. Judith is widely recognized as a pioneer in the art and science of human movement. As a young dancer, Aston was intrigued by the potential of the human body in motion. Early in her career, from 1963 to 1971, she created movement education programs for a community college, theater groups, dancers, and athletes. In 1968, Dr. Ida Ralph asked Judith Aston to create a, the very first movement education program for the Ralphing Foundation, where Aston taught her movement education curriculum until 1977. She is the author of Moving Beyond Posture, In Your Body, On the Earth, the Aston Postural Assessment Workbook, and Aston's Walking the New Body DVD. In this behind-the-scenes session, Judith, Judith shares with Massage and Body Work Magazine editor, Chief Leslie Young, the evolution of her ideas, the questions that keep her curious, and the informative movements in her life and career. I'd just like to take a moment to thank our global sponsor, Massage Envy. Massage Envy is committed to supporting your profession Massage Envy has donated to organizations that promote the healing benefits of massage and careers in massage therapy. Visit MassageEnvyCareers.com and click on Giving Back tab for more information. Massage Envy, more of a culture than a company. Thank you to our education partner, Associated Body Work and Massage Professionals, serving the massage and body work community through practical support, ethical standards, legislative advocacy, and public education. ABMP works for you. Visit them at abmp.com. Thanks to our daily sponsor, Massage and Body Work Magazine, Massage Today, BioFreeze, Bon Vitel, and the National Certification Board for Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. And now I'd like to welcome our guest host, Leslie Young, and our very special presenter, Judith Aston. It's wonderful to have you both here today. Thank you so much, Scott. I want to say just a couple more words about Judith before we get started here. She's a widely recognized as an award-winning pioneer in the art and science of kinetics for her discovery of the Aston paradigm and consequent development of the Aston kinetics, an educational system of movement and body work that aims to treat each person's body as unique to that person. Today, she designs an array of ergonomic products and continues to teach Aston kinetics training and certification courses. It's definitely my honor to share this time with you today, Judith. You having a wonderful day? Oh, yes, and Leslie, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Absolutely. We were uh, delighted here as we're looking back in the archives, back to uh, your smiling face in 1996 on the cover of Massage and Body Work Quarterly. It was a quarterly magazine back in those days. So um, we're coming full circle here and um, honoring everything that you've given the body work profession. Oh, thank so you let's so much. telling our listeners here today a little bit about what kind of child you were. Share some stories about little Judith with us. <laughs> you know, you asked for some photographs, and this was so interesting for me to think about this. As you can see, I was a chubby baby, and if I had continued on that track, I would have weighed the 140 pounds that Dr. Rolf wanted women to weigh to do her work instead of the 108 that I, that I did weigh. So <laughs> I guess uh, I changed paths there from uh, one, one expression to another. Um, but movement has always, always been my thing, and from early on I had a um, a knack for seeing and being able to mime or duplicate people's movement patterns. I just, I use that skill to this day, and I train people how to do that skill. 
<clears throat> I also um, thought back and realized I loved to fix things that were supposed to move, like broken watches and toys and things like that. I spent a lot of time dancing, and I kept myself very preoccupied with my creativity and constant awareness or interest in patterns. It didn't matter what the pattern was. I was always interested in looking at patterns and how long it took to repeat themselves and so on and so forth. Uh, but I do think my claim to fame was when I was 11, I was elected the first girl president of my elementary school. Yep, that's, that's what I think it is. Even even back then, <laughs> I love how uh, your play seemed to open the doors for your your career as it was to come. Can you share a little bit about the beginnings of your career and how you made that transition from your career in dance into the world of movement and body work? You know, by the time I got to high school, my aptitudes were becoming more clear. They seemed to be in math, abstract thinking, and evidently teaching. Um, by college, it had progressed to my being interested in how movement and stillness were used as communication, and I made it my master's thesis. Uh, UCLA didn't quite know what to do with me, so they insisted that I take on three department chair people uh, to do that particular thesis. So I had to go through the psychology department, the theater department, and the dance department. Um, and those ideas continued to be my interest as I started my first teaching job at Long Beach Community College in 1963, where I was hired to design programs for athletes, theater students, and dance students. But sometimes my interest in fun and my creativity uh, had... And, for example, this checkered floor was the type of floor that we had in the theater, in the lobby, when I was asked to do at least an annual concert every year for the college in dance theater. And I looked at that and I said, what a perfect setting for me to create a human checker game. So I announced to the audience that during intermission that the bodies would be dressed in, in clothes and socks so that you could just tap them on the shoulder and slide them across the linoleum floor and then they were prepared to either sit on someone's shoulders if they got kinged or if they got eliminated. You could drag them off the set. But the problem was that it was so successful, I couldn't get the audience to come back for the second half of the program <laughs> until the game was over. So I, I like to play with the creativity and, and surprises, but sometimes it surprises me back. Nice, nice. So talk to me a little bit about being a dancer and, and how that calling went for you. You know, um, I started really, really young with dance. Um, I think when I was seven and I got onto toe shoes pretty quickly after that. Um, but I just, uh, and then I went into modern and then I went into tap and then I went into, you know, all of these various things. And by the time I got to college, um, I continued with the dance, and one of the women uh, teachers there said, you really should go into this field and teach dance and movement for people. And so I went from Long Beach State College to um, UCLA in the dance department, and then I really became interested in the psychology of movement and the theater of movement and the humor of movement. So those were my basis, and I, I... continued to dance for a very, very long time. I was still dancing when I started working with Dr. Rolf. Nice. Thank you for that. Who, who along that early way was your muse? You know, um, a woman named Mrs. Marty Walker taught all the blind students at my high school, and I assisted her for one class every day for three years. And at the end of that time, she said, you were born to teach, you have to teach. Uh, uh, she was the smartest person I knew, and she was always inspirational. And one of the things that, as her assistant, I became aware of my tendency, I was always looking for an easier or better or faster way of doing something. And this has been my lifelong pattern. So I thank Mrs. Walker for directing me into the field of education. Mm hmm what other specifics do you think that she saw within you? 
Well, what was humorous was that she asked me, I guess, in my junior year, so what do you want to do with your career? And I said, um, be a flight attendant. And um, she said, uh, be a flight attendant. And she said, what? Why? And I said, um, I, <laughs> I want to fly, I want to travel, and I want to... Um, you know, travel around the world and see the world. And she said, oh, my goodness, you have other things on your plate. You have to really connect your, with your skills and your aptitudes. Go to college and study the new math since you are, seem to be skilled in that. Please do teach. So she was very instrumental. <laughs> we have much to thank her for. Anyone else who influenced you along the way before your bodywork career? Oh, probably many people influenced me because at UCLA I had such a great opportunity to work with wonderful people coming to teach from New York. You know, uh, Martha Graham, uh, people like Merce Cunningham and um, uh, Betsy Smith and um, the teachers there at UCLA, Alma Hawkins, um, Juana de Laban, you know, one of the daughters of uh, Rudolf Laban and Laban notation and work, um, all of these people. Valerie Hunt taught at UCLA when I was there. Uh, during the summer, I went up to work uh, for a couple of weeks with Anna Helprin and learned about happenings because we were, we were in, you know, this was the 60s, and these were wild and creative and artistic times. <laughs> we can only imagine. <laughs> There's much more on that. <laughs> I can that will say be a, about those happenings with Anna Halprin. Uh to be continued. How's that? Absolutely. Part part two of an interview it's someday. Um, you worked very closely with Dr. Ida Rolf for years. How did you meet Ida? From let's see, I well in nineteen sixty six I had a car accident where I was stopped and someone evidently going faster than fifty miles an hour rear ended me. And then I had another one. Uh, this time someone decided to try to cross a freeway for some reason, and um, I hit him but couldn't help it. Um, and these car accidents left me really in a lot of discomfort and unable to find relief from traditional treatments. Um, so I was continually looking for an option for healing. And in 1967, I started teaching and working at Kairos, which was a growth center fashioned after Esalen. Um, I became the movement lady there for several work sh workshops, and one of the leaders suggested I go see a white witch, Dr. Ida Rolf, that she had the skill and that she would be able to help me. So off I went to Big Sur, and she did not have any openings, so I sat on her doorstep, and finally, she had a cancellation on the second day. <laughs> you know, she'd open the door and go, not you again. <laughs> I'd say, I'm just waiting for a cancellation. And on the second day, she had one. And so she said, okay, I'll see you tomorrow at 2 o'clock. And when I came, I, I was introduced by her to the magic of the body that one could work on the tissue and it could change instantaneously. I had no idea. All I know is my heart, my soul, my being filled with hope that having experienced such discomfort and limitation for years, that she could help in, in moments. So I was so struck. And then toward the end of the session, you know, she'd been asking me a lot of questions. She said, I understand that you create movement programs for different disciplines. Could you create a movement program for my work? And I said, sure. <laughs> so I created this form of work, and in 1977 until, I mean, 1971 until 1977, I trained all rolfers and movement teachers in my ideas about movement and body mechanics and using your body well while working. I was very pleased when Dr. Rolf said she would be in charge of the static body and I could be in charge of the dynamic body. I said, all right, I like this. 
Now, I don't know about astrology, but some people seem very impressed that Dr. Rolf was a triple Taurus. Um, all I know is she was brilliant, she was always attentive, and she had such a great laugh. I love it. Uh, sounds like she respected your work even even back then. What was the working relationship like between the two of you, the connection between the two of you? Well, you know, she pretty much, uh, Dr. Roth had an idea about movement um, that was really quite simple. I mean, it didn't give me a lot to work on. Her idea was that you simply corrected all movements whether it was walking or sitting or doing yoga, by putting in the Rolf line and sustaining that Rolf line while you moved. And I'm doing it now. Um, you have the pelvis in the posterior tuck and the waistline back. You have the feet straight ahead and close together, the knees slightly soft, the elbows out, chest is up, chin is in, top of the head is pulled up, and that was the Rolf line. So she pretty much let me create on my own and what I did by, you know, being trained in the rolfing by her also was look at the movements she used during the rolf process and different ideas like that and I put them together in this initial class in 1971 in Big Sur. And then it just, you know, once I taught it, then it continuously changed from one class to the next because You know, it's one thing when you start to um, disagree with someone else's theory, but it's quite another when you realize you're teaching something that you disagree with. So I had to say, hmm, this is not working, and figure out other options. Ida was very supportive of the work um, uh, and encouraging of me training lots of people in the movement work um, for a very, very long time. Nice. You know, so many people describe her as, uh, as demanding and quite the taskmistress, if you will, And but you remember her laugh the best. I remember her laugh the best. You know, um, there were some um, challenges in terms of uh, coordinating some of my new ideas because they they really didn't have any standard approval for what alignment was supposed to be or movement was supposed to be. So it created some challenges along the way. But, you know, really, Dr. Rolf didn't ask me to train her work, uh, to change her work. Um, and so as I started to explore, I realized I just had to keep moving forward with this idea of following what seemed to be intuition expressed and then materializing for me. So that's what happened there. And I'm so grateful. If she hadn't asked me to create the first movement program, I would never have known I even had an interest, let alone an aptitude for body work. Mm, Beautiful. Did she attend any of those early classes? Oh, she did. And she was so cute. She said, you know, now, Judith, don't don't even know, don't even pay attention that I'm here. I'm just a fly on the wall. And I'd say, oh, okay, Dr. Rolf, that's fine. And then I would start, you know, and I'd be out with the first sentence. And she'd go, but actually. <laughs> and after a while, I'd say, oh, the fly speaks. <laughs> So it was cute. I wanted her input, and she gave it initially, and it was very important that I get her input. So that was great. Uh, Thank you so much for for sharing that. You know, oftentimes we have an aha moment or a stroke of insight that changes the way we see our work. Have you had any aha moments? (laughs) Lastly, my life has been a series of aha moments. I don't even know. I'm working on figuring out something. It, it's happening someplace back in my brain or my body, and then suddenly there's a light bulb moment, and I hear myself say, that's it. And I didn't even know that I was processing this for, you know, a year, two years, a month, 24 hours, whatever it is. It just emerges. So while I had progressed uh, the skill of seeing bodies and teaching movement, you know, 
the new paradigm that was emerging for me really became clear by the 70s. And then it just started that I could see I would apply that to all product design. I would just apply that new paradigm to yoga and Pilates and rehab, um, uh, rehabilitation exercises. And, and it was just um, I, I couldn't help myself, you know. It, in, in 1990, I loved the light bulb because in 1990, I became a charter member of the Nevada Inventors Association, and, and I helped design the logo, which was a light bulb with a cowboy hat on it for Nevada. And um, so that was really fun. And um, I don't know, by now I've probably designed over a couple hundred products. They're not, all in, they're not all in being manufactured, but I have designs. Right. So you've really been able to kind of combine your ahas with your entrepreneurial spirit, haven't you? Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. You've worked with so many pioneers in the bodywork profession through the Renaissance in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I also understand you had a chance to meet with movement pioneer Moshe Feldenkrais. Can you tell us what that experience was like? Oh, my goodness, yes. You know, in the 60s, I... What became acquainted with the human potential movement, which was taking over California, and um, and this went in through the 70s, and all these growth centers um, s- sprung up, and so on and so forth. So I got to work with Dr. Roth, Moshe Feldenkrais, Virginia Satir, Alan Watts, Fritz Perls, Anna Halperin, Arnold Cagle, Valerie Hunt, Eric Erickson, and so many special people that. I had a chance to either teach for or present with over the years. Um, in 1972, I got word that Moshe Feldenkrais would be coming to Big Sur to teach his very first U.S. training. And I wanted to go and to ask the master, would he please <laughs> tell me why some of the things I had discovered were working why were they working so well? I wanted an explanation, and he was a physicist, and he was brilliant. And instead of explaining to me, he just simply decided to be supportive and refer people to me for my ideas until actually his last training in the U.S., where he had so many hundreds of students. I just adored the man. He was a joy to work with. Uh, I only got to work with him briefly, but... He was so supportive at different points during my career. Um, I felt really honored to have known him. Thank you. You also mentioned there uh, the famous psychologist, Fritz Perls, who's most well-known for gestalt therapy. What was your connection with Dr. Perls? How did that relate to your work? You know, it was such a thrilling time to be around at that time where so many people were present in these communities, and my friend Dick Price was training with Fritz, and so was the psychiatrist that I was co-leading groups with was training with Fritz. So I attended several of Fritz's group sessions. I was the movement lady during his workshop days at Kairos, um, and through Fritz's work, I was able to quickly see how we reveal ourselves, whether in a dream or pers- or just personifying um our awareness. Um, one of his techniques was that as a gestalt, you can become all the parts of your experience and speak for those expressions. And this became a, the content for people's awareness and for change. But as I observed the doctor in the doctor's seat and the patient or client in the hot seat, I was often struck that the hot seat client was less aware of their communications or things going on with them than all the outside observers in the workshop. So I suggested we add a third chair called the witness chair and ask the client once in a while to come over and sit in that chair. And lo and behold, they became as aware as uh, that things were as obvious as everybody else sitting in the room. It was very, very... It was it was thrilling, actually. So, you know, it's one of my things. Again, I don't know that everyone is interested in my suggestions, but the psychiatrist was. I would imagine he would be. 
So let's dial back just a little bit. You talked about um, a, a serious car accident in 1966, so you kind of alluded to the fact that uh, your health and your career hasn't really been without setbacks. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the injuries that you sustained and how maybe they um, kind of furthered your development as a movement therapist? Yes. You know, my students um, tell me now that I have done enough injuries, I've had enough injuries, and rehabilitated myself that I know enough now to rehabilitate, to help other people with their rehabilitation, and I don't need to do any more injury to myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I take that, I take that, and I will heed that. Um, but in this, in these two car accidents where I was hit behind and then hit from the side, um, I just could not, uh, there was so much nerve pain, and the traditional techniques that I tried um, were not aware of soft tissue injuries at that time. They, you know, it ranged all the way from let's fuse your back, which would affect you not being able to dance, to, um, you know, I think this might all be in your head uh, because we can't find anything wrong with you, and we don't know why you can't straighten up or teach movement, but... Um, these are our ideas. So um, there was that, and then um, in 1993, I broke my leg, and I crushed my right knee skiing, and it had to be rebuilt from my ilium. Um, and then I had one more in 2011 where I crushed the bottom of the tib fib and the top of the cuboid bone on my left foot. And most of, in most cases... The prognosis of these serious accidents was bleak. I was told that I should readjust my thinking to being disabled enough that I should consider a different career. And I remember, you know, probably a certain trait of being stubborn as well. In all cases, I would say, no, I don't think so. So it was my mission to figure out how to apply the theories that were now so active in my life and work to the circumstances, and they were extremely successful. So now I happily share these discoveries with many people that treat patients in recovery that come to learn these things or private clients who come. So, yes, I have used them to my advantage, and I'm very struck many times by people will come in for a session and they'll bring a back brace or something, and I have this puzzled look, and they say, why are you looking at the brace that way? And I said, so do you wear it this way? And they say, no, no, you've got it on upside down and backwards. And I say, really? So so the brace holds you in flexion in the very pattern that you're trying to get out of that has created the bulging discs and so on. Is that correct? And they say, well, when you put it like that, it seems strange. And I said, well, could you just wear it upside down and backwards for a moment and tell me? And often I would put it on them and they'd say, well, that feels so much better. And I'd go, I do not know why these products are designed this way. So you see, it just keeps me, there isn't a moment there that some aha, some question doesn't spark me into direction. So there I go, Leslie. Well, and very lucky for, for the rest of us. I guess I'm also curious, like, that seed of tenacity where you are able to turn around something that has stopped other people, but yet you're turning it around to movement and health for yourself and also for others. Yes, thank you. Yes. Judith, when you think about your beginnings in the bodywork profession and you view the profession now, what trends emerge for you? You know, I um, I feel so positive about the teaching methods these days in schools and the amount of information that's accessible to the students and the research and all of this current knowledge base with the tremendous boost from technology has just created a remarkable, informed field of practitioners, which I am... I am so impressed with. Um, I also appreciate the emphasis on the evidence-based systems. However, for people like me, 
since my strong suit has been innovation, I hope there will always remain support and encouragement for innovators and their different way of looking at things. Um, and sometimes, just having gone through this for decades myself, that I would have people get, I, I mean, sometimes quite verbally upset saying, you cannot say these things without research. You cannot document this. And I will say, but I started this lecture by saying, my system is empirical. This is what I have learned by working with thousands of people and our practitioners now by working with hundreds of thousands of people. And I would love for it to be research, but these are my findings. If they can serve you well, please try them. And so when people say or encourage schools to only attend classes that are evidence-based, I wonder if this isn't somehow short-circuiting some of those innovators from moving forward and trying new things as well. So that's one of the things that I wanted to say. You know, like it's very satisfying after all these years that the current fascial research gives relative, relevance to some of my theories for the moving body, and yet it still will always come down to a specific interpretation or application of those theories that might be different than the way I'm interpreting it. So I, I, I'm sure, Leslie, you're aware of the fascial research, you know, and the significance that they have now documented that one needs to preload tissue, tissue before action. Um, and, you know, for me, of course that's true, and not in just any way. It has to be in specific ways to line up the force vectors within those fascial planes with gravity and GRF to massage for change in hydration. And I realized as I was thinking about this that let me just give you a couple of examples. For example, the directions of loading, the sequence of what body parts and tissues need to load first, the speed with which they load, and the other factors of asymmetry and direction will determine the accuracy, for example, of pitching a ball, thinking about the World Sea Series recently. And any other sequence in any other order will give a totally different result. I look at that kind of detail, and I teach people to look at that kind of detail so that if someone is wanting to make up for losing strength as they age, they would need to increase the speed and the force of that loading to allow them to maximize the spring load, the release, as a substitute for strength. So they use leverage to specifically catapult that force into action. So those are just a couple of examples that if people only take a class that is evidence-based, I would miss the opportunity to share those, those ideas with people. So I hope that doesn't become the only way. <laughs> I think in our eclectic uh, profession we don't have any danger of that, but I, I love your examples of living the, um, you know, the evidence-based but also the in innovation uh, moving yes. forward there. Thank you for that. Oh, good. Um, as the profession has evolved throughout your career, is there anything about the way it's evolved that surprised you? Has it unfolded in the way you've hoped it would? In many ways, absolutely. In many ways, absolutely. And again, it's about interpretation. I think these days people are much more interested in the whole person, uh, the holistic approach. Um, and they speak about all those parts of the human being in terms of the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, ancestral, and energetic um, parts. And when it comes down to the actual, well, how do those parts play when you're teaching Pilates? How do they play into a lesson? And how do they play into the integration I find sometimes is more general because people aren't training people to really look at how to apply to those other aspects. So I hope it won't get too generalized. 
for example, that um, that assessment, for example, is simply postural asset assessment looking at the lines of high, of tilts and and uh, shear patterns and so on. But that it is, it's more than that. It's about the three dimensional body. And one of the things I learned a long time ago is that if I look at a body, I ask, I wonder why this person needs to be in this particular pattern it immediately opens up the possibilities for exploration and discovery without blame or immediately trying to correct the flaws that the person sees in front of them. So I, I, I feel that people really need to expand and take the time to study assessment and palpation and visual of alignment and dimension and study movement and progress their skills, it just takes time. It's not something you can get in a weekend. I, I agree. I agree. Are, are there any next steps in addition to that that you see for the profession as a whole? I think really just progressing these skill sets, you know, and um, I think progressing the skill sets of being able to, you know, like for me, one of the excitements is having my aha moments create aha moments for so many other people, and they create aha moments for all those other people. And um, if people are taught mainly about holding patterns for being correct and things they have to do and should do, and they're not taught self-care and, and problem-solving, I think they're missing out. So in the middle of those aha moments of yours, what are some of the questions you still hold about the human body and the healing process? Well, <laughs> all I have to do is take a look, <laughs> and I have the next question. You know, it's like early on when I was coming up with much of this work, some of the clients would say, you know, you ask so many questions. Why don't you just tell me the answers? And I say, no, no, I don't have the answers. You do. I'm just asking so I can go on, you know. Um, and um, I just feel that it's it's easy to come up with questions, and then it takes a certain amount of time to play with them, to to figure out how to best serve the person who has that tendency for learning or the person who has this skill or the person who is so highly limited because of their stroke um, so that it may be that we're still teaching someone how to sit comfortably, but those variables of those three examples I just gave, the whole process is totally different. And learning how to make the difference for the person who is so unique is what our work is all about. Judith, what ignites your, this curiosity of yours and inspires you to keep learning and exploring? You know, um, this photo of this girl, this 12, well, I think she turned 13, uh, these three photos are over a, uh, one month, uh, I think November 30th, one year, to December 30th that same year, and I did three sessions with her. And when you get changes like this, it's like from bodywork and movement and ergonomics and teaching her how to help herself, you go, well, how do we, how do we bring this together to teach more people how to get these kind of changes and what the person can do on their own? So, you know, I've got the fire under me right away when I see a, the result of a session or someone who is in one session. They go, I just feel hope for the first time in 20 years or it's been 25 years since Vietnam that I've been able to have both feet come directly under me. Thank you so much. You know, those all you have to have is those successes. And you go, well, I'm on board for life. I'm on board. And then, you know, I can't help myself with this a 
assessment business, I look at a person like this fellow standing, and you see he kind of slants to the left. And so I thought, well, what would it look like if I put his two left sides together and his two right sides together? And I look at that, and I look at the differences. And I want people to understand that sometimes the asymmetry is too much and unnecessary. And what can we do to make it a little closer, the right to left side? But that's not the only asymmetry in the body. What about the asymmetry at the front of the body, to the back of the body? So I put those parts together and people go, oh my goodness, never even thought about that. Well, what would happen if you really had two fronts connected? How would that change our life, you know? And so when I taught for years people how to be symmetrically on hold in order to dance and to exercise. You know, I, and I learned that the aura before everything in the body movement would be slightly asymmetrical. Unlike, I just read a write-up of Aston Patterning in this book that said, Aston Pat- uh, Judith Aston believes in asymmetry instead of balance. Now, I have no idea how this author or what she read um, would come up with that conclusion, <laughs> but this is not the case. It's that, to me, balance is how we negotiate the natural and the injury made asymmetry in the body for balance. So I'm continuously lit up about those ideas and all the others. <laughs> Thank you for that. I love these pictures that we have of you uh, you teaching, and I will never forget watching you, in effect, dance on, a, on an exercise bike at the Structural Integrators Conference in Boston, what, some seven years ago or so. So when I, I look at the looks on these students' faces, it uh, really resonates with me. You've had such a very long and, and productive career. What gets you out of bed every morning, Judith, to continue your work? Where do you get your passion? You know, to me, moment to moment is an opportunity, you know. You go to the market and you see someone having trouble getting out of the car and instantaneously I'm thinking, gee, if they knew. So I kind of send that thought, but I would never go up and say, oh, try this. I've learned that... People have to ask for assistance, otherwise it really feels too judgmental to me. Um, So sometimes you can create opportunities like that, but when people come to classes, they invite you to share, and, you know, it's just thrilling to see how people that take classes take these concepts and thrive using them and teach so many other people. I'm, I'm just thrilled about that. And then this last slide, I received an award um, at the World Massage Festival in August this year for my 50 years of uh, teaching and contributing to the field. So that's James Waslowski there and me with the award. So, yes, it's been a long time. It's wonderful to see you in the, in the spotlight, Judith. As a master teacher of body work and movement education, what do students experience in your classes they cannot get anywhere else? You know, um, there are, through the years, Leslie, you've heard me say at these different conferences and conventions that that we all need each other. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that... Um, that one system replaces all the systems. Never would I say that because we all have our contributions. And while I know that Aston Kinetics is a very comprehensive system with many forms of movement and body work and coaching and fitness and ergonomics, there are systems now that you know, because I started that focus for Dr. Roth way back in the early 70s that it would go into movement and coaching and fitness and ergonomics. And so there are many systems that focus on those areas. 
The difference is the interpretation of the, those areas, how the body interfaces with the computer and the desk, and how people interface between them, their body, and their shoe for running, and and so on. Those are the details that I love to assist people with. And just recently, we ha- I had two experiences that, you know, I was talking in class. Uh, uh, this person told me that when I was talking in class about the patterns within a car, like the the design of the car seats and the position of the accelerator and brake pedals and the angle of the rearview mirror. One of the students told me later that he said, well, that's it. I have to do the training because she's thought of everything that the body does. <laughs> I said, really? What got you? He said, well, when you start talking about the angle of, <laughs> of the rearview mirror, doesn't really support the body moving in, in a curve. Uh, he said, that was it. I signed up. And then last uh, last month I did a training uh, called Aston for Pilates Teachers, and one of the students was shaking her head, and I said, what ha- what's happening? And she said, I guess I just have to follow you, follow you around and learn all this information. It's just, it's just so much. And that to me is, um, that's, that's my passion. I love teaching this. I love teaching this. Well, clearly your, your life's, life's work. Mm-hmm. In your estimation, Judith, who are other people doing interesting exploration or teaching who might influence the massage and body work profession moving forward? You know, I have been so impressed to watch the role of the World Massage Conference people and their organization and how how important that has played into educating therapists around the world, connecting all of us. I mean, I congratulate all of you for that. Um, and I'm grateful for those opportunities. And then through the years of watching ABMP grow and the quality and quantity of the expansion of effective learning tools provided by you to all of us is amazing. So my suggestion is that when people go to the World Massage Conference and the ABMP sites and look at the list of people invited to present, they will have the names of the leaders in the field. Well, thank you for that rounding endorsement, Judith. But it's, um, I'm sure from your vantage point, it's, it has been fascinating to, to watch. Mine's only a, a decade long at this point, and it's been um, quite, the, quite the synergy to be part of it. So thank you for that. Well, of course. Of course. You're welcome. So let's transition off the subject of body work for a moment and talk about the other factors in your life that keep you motivated, interested, and inspired. Who are you when you're not doing work in our profession? You know, um, my goal for this life um, has been to pay attention to the lessons and to become a better person because of it. That's my mission. And... um, I really appreciate the study. <laughs> well, n- not at all moments, let's put it that way. Not all of the lessons, the, the, particularly the painful ones, but they're there to learn, aren't they? So, And luckily, I am so blessed by a wonderful partnership with my husband, Brian Linderoth, for the last 30 years. You know, I, Leslie, I think I'm the same, whether I would be doing the work. I think I'm the same person. I'm still pondering most all of the time, but when I have time on, off, I am less pressured by the business part of the work. I love to cook. I love to be creative in the kitchen, and I have had the great fortune to live in beautiful places. So my life is blessed. Well, good for you, but well, well earned. Can you imagine a completely different life? If you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? Well, 
you know, I've come to so many crossroads in my life, and it seems pretty clear at the moment that they appear that I need to go right on this one and up on that one and down on that one and so on and so forth. And and each one has led to the next step that provided a piece to the puzzle that I was looking to put together. And I think because my work is so varied from one moment to the next that it may be that it's just the same me applying my interest in creativity to another area, you know, like mm-hmm. if I were to help someone with their business or take up gardening or wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice? Right. I do, All work. Your... I do work a lot. I do work a lot. <laughs> I have no doubt. I have no doubt. <laughs> so you talked about loving to cook. And if you could have any two people over to share dinner with, who would you invite? Well, I would probably want someone else to fix the dinner because usually I'm very busy preparing and serving and I miss out on all the the good bits of the conversation. So I'd have to take care of that first. Um, but I find people so interesting that there are many, many people to invite, um, mainly because I believe everybody has many stories and it's so interesting to get them talking about their history and and their their fascinations. Um, in Hawaii here, you often hear people say, let's just get together and talk story. Um, and sometimes you can go to an event called Talk Story, and they'll have musicians or hula dancers come, and they'll talk about the history of hula, and their personal history with it, and then they'll do a hula, and it, it's it's so um, so special. So uh, I'd like to listen, and I've had the great fortune to listen to wonderful Hawaiian elders and storytellers like Robert Bly, and people talking about what it is or whom they love. Yes, it could be many people. Hmm. Okay, so you're not going to surprise us by reaching back over time and and naming two people to bring forward to dine with. I just, (laughs) you could could pick any two and I'd be thrilled. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Very diplomatic. Okay, we now would have a little fun with some famous questions from the actor's studio. Are you ready, Judith? Okay. (laughs) All right, what is your... Favorite word? Probably. Aloha. Mm, nice. And uh, and give those of us on the very large island the def- your definition of aloha. Oh, it means so many things. There, are people who might want to look it up because there's a beautiful writing about aloha and the a is this word in Hawaiian, and it means this. And by the time you finish reading that, you have a template for guiding the essential, positive parts of your life. So, Beautiful. We have Aloha homework to do then. Yes, Aloha homework. What is your least favorite word? War. What turns you on? Someone's success, um, an aha, or for me, um, a possibility. And what turns you off? Closed-mindedness, that someone's saying, no, there are, there's no option for change. What sound do you love? The ocean, the bubbling brook, the crackling fire you know i i think about this because as a child i was always so active that i would notice that when i sat by the ocean or these other areas i felt so calm so it was very interesting it was the movement of the water the movement of the fire the sounds just so it's been a big part of my meditation for my life Huh, so you were drawn to the earth elements even even then. 
Mm-hmm. And what sound do you hate? Screeching machinery, uh, jackhammer, uh, chainsaw, those kinds of things. All right. What's your favorite curse word? Oh, well, well, one of the re, uh, uh, required pieces when you become a dancer at the UCLA Dance Department is you learn a couple of words that fly around there, particularly in choreographing and rehearsing. Um, and I'm going to guess, people can probably guess uh, what these single words are, and they are very effective, but I, I don't feel comfortable in them. Repeating them on this program. <laughs> this does not surprise me. I know you to be the, the ultimate lady. What profession would you not like to participate in? Um, I know it's just consistent uh, for me, but um, anyone that has no possibility for change. Okay. I just okay. feel when people get together, people have good ideas and... There's usually always a better way, yeah. easier or something like that. Mm-hmm. Particularly if you're involved, <laughs> from what I've seen. <laughs> okay, and one final question here. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Welcome. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and- welcome, yes, indeed, Welcome. Judith, I can't thank you enough for your your time today. I'm going to remember this always as when I learned more about the the intuition of Judith Aston and the magic of the body. So thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation to join you. Thank you. Scott, we'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you very much, Leslie Young, for doing a fabulous job hosting. And, of course, thank you very, very much to Judith Aston for an outstanding presentation. Once again, I'd like to take time to thank our sponsors who helped make the World Massage Conference the most affordable and accessible continuing education opportunity for massage and bodywork practitioners around the globe. Thank you to our global sponsor, Massage Envy. Like you, Massage Envy is out to make a positive difference in people's lives. Visit MassageEnvyCareers.com or like Massage Envy Careers on Facebook to learn more. It could be the best career move you've ever made. And of course, thank you to our education partner, Associated Body Work and Massage Professionals, serving the massage and body work community through practice support, ethical standards, legislative advocacy, and public education. ABMP works for you. Visit them at abmp.com. Thanks to our daily sponsors, Massage and Body Work Magazine, Massage Today, BioFreeze, Bon Vitel, the National Certification Board for Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. On behalf of my World Massage Conference team, Melanie Hayden, Eric Brown, Marla Gold, and myself, Scott Darnell, thank you for joining us, and be well. <laughs>